around on the other side and see if I can give you a crack solid here. Oh no! That we did that with the lifting. Give me a grid. E3. Enhance. Aha. It's true. It wasn't my fault. It wasn't. Hi, I'm Tim. And I'm Karen. And welcome to this episode of Living a French Life. The stove saga continues. It does. Um, what are our options? We've got options. Um, so, we've got a broken stove. We can try to get it repaired. I've got... Uh, uh, these stoves are very popular in the British Isles. And uh, I found a line on somebody in Ireland. That's part of the EU. So, the shipping back and forth should be uh, perhaps a little easier. Uh, we don't have any costs yet, so we'll have to see what's what. So, repair the stove is option number one. Uh, number two, buy another stove just like this. <laughs> or get one, get one sent to us. <laughs> Come on, Essie. <laughs> you know, my, my first choice would be a new wood cook stove. And we talk about Essie cook stoves a lot, and that's because... I like the way they cook. I like the multiple ovens. I like having the multiple hobs. I like the kilowatt of heat they put out. I like the way they look. The size works perfectly in the contour. There happens to be one in, in black enamel <laughs> uh, at, at one of the distributors up in Strasbourg. But that stove is over 9,000 euros. And sure. Strasbourg is on the other side of France. But they do deliver and okay. they install for a mere thousand euros. So for half the price of yeah. what we paid for the house, we could mm -hmm. have a really great stove. Okay. Come on. I really think Essie just needs to send us one of those stoves and let us be a distributor in oh. southwest France. That works for me. I think it'd be perfect. <laughs> But that's probably not the most viable option, is it? No, probably, it's a long shot, no question about it. But Karen does have another great option. I do. A much more affordable wood cook stove. It needs to provide heat because it is the main source of heat for our house in the wintertime. But it'll offer a single oven. It's a Swedish design uh, manufactured in Germany. The delivery is very uh, reasonable and the installation is far more straightforward. It also would allow us to have a conventional uh, oven and cooktop in there, which we might appreciate in the summertime. That's true. I mean, as much as I like grilling, there are some times when I want to cook something inside the house. Right. Can you make pasta outside on a grill? Sure, we can figure that out. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure we will. Because we're going to be camping in yes. uh, in about six weeks' time when we have to leave where we're renting. Uh, so we're going to find out all kinds of things that you can cook outside. Yeah, I guess we are. Uh, for the rest of the episode, uh, we're going to show uh, what we've done with the superstructure underneath the house to get it all firm and solid. And uh, Karen... Yes, I finished the Contu. It looks fabulous. So we'll give you sort of a reminder of where we started and give you a reveal of where we finished off. She did a great job on that. No question. I had help. <laughs> uh, great teacher, and uh, my kids pitched in when they were here over Easter, so there's already a lot of memories infused into that stone. So, like and subscribe, and allons-y. Well, today's the day. I'm going to start pointing on the back stone wall of the contu or fireplace. And you really don't need that many materials and it isn't very expensive in order to do the work. It just takes a little bit of practice. You begin always with having your protective gear. Because you're working with lime, you need to make sure to have goggles and appropriate gloves. Lime is incredibly caustic to the skin and you need to be sure that you're protecting your hands. A mask and gloves so that when you're working with the dry lime and adding water to it, you're not breathing in any of the dust. You need water for your mix and you need a way to wet down the stone. 
you want to put the mortar into the stone after it's been damp. So a big sprayer does quick work of that. You could use a hand sprayer too if you wanted. You're doing small sections at a time. I've got my little hammer chisel tool to take out any additional material that I want between the stones. And then I've got a wire brush and a regular brush and another little brush that I use in order to help smooth out the joints while the mortar is still slightly uh, damp, not completely dry. I'll talk about that in the process. And then I've got the actual mortar mix. This is going to be a pre-made mix, so it has the very fine sand that I need and the lime mixed together. It makes a really nice whiter shade of grout and I'm really pleased with it. It's expensive. Uh, this bag runs approximately 20, 23 euros and for one bag. So I would not advise this if you were doing a large project. When we point the outside of the house, we will have a huge amount of sand dumped in one pile and um, purchase our lime separate. It's very affordable that way. But this is a small project and it was just easier to buy a bag of a premix. I think it's gonna take me two bags in order to do the back wall. A skilled individual probably could do it with one bag easy, but I tend to drop a lot, so we're gonna see how that goes. And then the tools. You need a trowel. Uh, this is probably called something else, but I call them my trowel. And you need um, a larger one. Seemed to work better for me, the little bit of practice that I've done. And we'll, I'll talk about why the larger one can hold more product and allow me to get into the deep holes that I have. The smaller one, though, helps me to smooth out the grout between the cracks. But I think this medium one, which is the one I'm going to try today, might even be the best of both worlds. But you find a trowel that works for you, and again, really affordable tools to purchase. And then you need a, um, I forget what this is called, a pallet in order to put your mixed mortar on and something to mix your mortar in. And that is it. So the tools are simple. The expense is fairly small. And I'm hoping we're going to have a good effect as we begin to fill the joints between the stones in the fireplace. I started a little bit the other day and then it got really frightfully cold. We actually had quite a bit of snow here, which is all melted by now and I think I can get back at trying it again. The thing about pointing or grouting between the stones is it just is practice. You need to get comfortable with the material and the tools, and I'm hoping I'm going to find a bit of a rhythm today. I might be uh, a little ambitious here as to how much I'm going to get done today. The reason we're wetting down the wall is we want the grout to stick within the crevices of the stone. If you don't wet the wall, then the stone is going to pull the moisture out of the mortar and the mortar is just going to fall out and that's not what you want. So we talked about the different tools that you need in order to point a stone wall. Now we've got to mix the mortar and it's a really good idea to wear goggles for this and definitely a mask. You don't want to breathe in any of this. Again, it's show or lime and it's incredibly caustic. as the water will last for you know a couple of hours so you can mix up a fair amount because you will no doubt get through it fairly quickly what the experts say the professionals who do this for a living they say it's best to point in the morning and they're fast at it I'm I am frightfully slow is to point in the morning and then go for lunch and then return in the afternoon to do the finish work. Perhaps maybe touch up some holes you missed, smooth out the grout lines if that's the desired effect you want, and take care of whatever you want to change about it prior to the mortar drying completely.
you don't want your mix too thin because then it's going to run down your, your stones. But you don't want it so thick that it's difficult to work with. This one's a little bit thin, I think. So I'm going to add a bit more of the dry mix and then I think we'll be about right. So this is exactly what they would be using when the walls originally went in. They would use sand brought in from the garden or down from the riverbed. Okay. see if we can make this look great on that wall. I put my pan of mortar under where I'm working because I drop a lot of it. You could also use some sort of protecting covering for your floor. It's really important because it gets very rather, rather messy. All right, not too bad here. We have begun the process and I think it's gonna work out just fine I really like the color of the grout sometimes they can go a little bit um, red or peachy and I don't like that as you know or sometimes they can go really gray and that might be just the right color for you but I was looking for something that was a little bit more white not too yellow and I think I found it in this pre-made mix so we're gonna be using this for the rest of the contour and then work on pointing the big wall in the back <laughs> no, I just meant the back one. Yeah. Voila! <laughs> Pointed this wall. And you remember what it looked like? I mean, I am so pleased with how this came out. And I've never done any pointing before, but Francis gave me a, a lesson, provided the tools, we talked about consistency of the mix, and then it was just practice. And it turns out my children actually are really good pointers too. My daughter did this section, and then my son helped me work the top. And it is rather therapeutic. And uh, the good news is I have that whole back wall to do, and then next spring, I'll be pointing the entire exterior of the home. Today, Francis and I are going to have a crack at making the pillar that's going to hold up the, uh, the steel beams that we're going to put in to replace the uh, broken, rotted oak beam. And that's what's going to hold up the whole rest of the house. Uh, we've got quite a project ahead of us, so let's get it going. These are the concrete blocks we're going to be using. And if you recall from a few episodes ago, this is the concrete uh, footer that we poured. And that is what's going to support most of the weight. You'll notice that there are some rebar, reinforcing bars sticking up out of the concrete. And that is going to tie all of it together. The concrete blocks are going to go over the reinforcing bars and we'll build a solid tower out of that, but then we're going to fill 
the holes in the concrete block with more concrete. So it's going to be extremely, extremely overbuilt. It's very sturdy. It's going to hold the whole house up with no problem for many years to come. Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> Here goes the block. The next one going on. Watch the fingers. I'm telling you, man. There's a lot of trust going on here. All right, so to do the final filling of the concrete on our little tower here, uh, you can see we put in these, uh, these uh, metal boards along the side and clamp them into place so that none of the concrete will leak out. That is going to be one sturdy, sturdy column holding up the house. All right, so we need to get the EPN, uh, the die beams that we're gonna put down in the cuff. And uh, as it turns out, we found some used ones at the metal yard that are moins cher. Less expensive, so I'm all for that. Javier is measuring them to make sure that they cut them to the right length. And of course, the always, always helpful Francis here to help. Foundation steel going in. going in to the cellar. It's okay, Lucy. It's okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's a pretty exciting day. One piece down there. Oh, you're fine. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Xavier doing his thing, man. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Holy smokes. Wow, okay, there we go. We got steel. Okay. Wait. Okay. Francis is going to tap a nail down here to hold this this post in place. It's kind of a temporary jack. And then we're going to lift the I-beam up into our little holder here. And that will give it a temporary home while we ready the rest of it. Tim holds up the house. 
Okay. All right. So I'll go make a cup of tea. Out. And then straight. Yeah. Right there. Ready? Yeah. All right. Francis is turning this. This is an adjustable jack, and they were raising the I beam up so that it's in contact with the existing beams, the existing floor joists. All right. Is the ball? No. Oh, okay. I've, uh... Dog. <laughs> All right, so what you got here, you can see that while we are touching over here, we are not touching here, here, or here, because we have not yet raised the I-beam up to level, and that's what Francis is taking care of right now. Say something about that? <laughs> I think it's pretty self explanatory. <laughs> As you can see, the uh, former bean, what will be the former bean, uh, just not going anywhere. That's what's holding up the house. Hey, does that bean move? That it's sitting one? on? This okay. <laughs> okay. So, so you can see why it needed some attention down here. Yes. It's a good thing you're here holding it up. You went through the front of your yeah, well. <laughs> This is a close-up view of what we're dealing with and why we had to uh, put in the I-beams in the first place. This is what the wooden beam has become. It is really mostly just, it's practically dirt. You know, the natural processes, uh, insects and, and time, uh, turning wood into dirt. And this side's even worse. Well, that's why we're putting in the I-beams. Not your usual carpentry tool. So you've got the I-beam that is going, going this way, and it's going to support the I-beams that are going this way. And that's going to sit on top of this concrete block column that we filled with more concrete. And we're just doing the last bit of it now. We're going to lock this I-beam into the whole system by pouring concrete in through the top over here. This paper is jammed in here into the spaces between the I-beam so that uh, the concrete won't leak out. And it's going to require a little attention to make sure it all stays in there. Here's a good sign that the ironwork that we're putting in is actually doing the job of supporting the house. This used to support this corner over here, uh, which is underneath the contour. We're going to reinforce this for the stove because uh, the cooker that we're going to be using is heavy. Uh, it's over 600 pounds and we want to make sure since this concrete we didn't do, we don't know if they did it right, so we're going to reinforce it, overbuild it just to make sure everything's safe. But how we know that the ironwork is doing its job is because this is no longer holding anything up. <laughs> hey, honey, come around and look up in the hole. What's, what do you want me to do? <laughs> I'm videoing now. I'm videoing. Oh my gosh. Where's Joe? Attention. Oh. Okay. Woo it made it. It made it in one piece. What's in the hole? Rock, you know, just, just sitting. There's no hole. It's just sitting on the ground. 
Wow, you uh, guys. For those of you who were watching when we put this thing in, <laughs> yeah. we went down we went wow. down over three feet. We went down one meter to make sure that we had a good solid base. And then wow. we filled it with concrete. This is just sitting on the mud. Sitting on the mud. But soon it'll be sitting in the garden. Okay. <laughs> Limestone weighs about 150 pounds per cubic foot. Uh, you guys are going to have to do your own math on that to get it metric. But so this is about six feet long and uh, it's about a, a foot square going all the way around there. So that means it's about 900 pounds of limestone. Half a ton. Are you checking out the house? You are. Hi, sweetie. So <laughs> we're getting a lot done and that explains the big gaps between the videos. You know, you only have so much time in the day and if you're working on the house, you don't have time to put the videos together. But I'm working on that and we got the next, I don't know, about next half dozen videos lined up and that's gonna put us right into moving into season two. That's right, season two begins as we uh, embark on camping. <laughs> hopefully with a toilet in in our house so you'll get to see how we manage working the restoration while living in the place at the same time it's it's going to be something no question about it but things are moving along really well and uh and i think you're going to enjoy a lot of the videos coming up i'm hoping that we'll be able to have some more reveals because so far, you've been patient to stick with us if you've done all of the, not the least bit, fun work. And, and now I really want to get into creating interior spaces that are, that are beautiful. This is, this is where Karen really shines. So I, have, I am so ready for it. <laughs> I don't know if all my ideas will play out, but it'll be fun to see. Uh, yeah, well, that's, that's uh, you know, one of the things we talk about, the flexibility. You know, yep. you have an idea, then when you get in the space, you have to right you have to roll with it you know we are not professional architects we do not we do not have a complete grasp of every single possible uh, material and how it can fit into every possible space but this is our ninth project <laughs> we're like semi pro yeah it's our ninth <laughs> project so at least we know what we need what we like and uh, we know our budget yeah and i know which end of the hammer to use so that's right he that does and I, I manage every now and again. <laughs> so uh, that ought to wrap it up here for this week's episode. Um, make sure to join us again next time when we do something really fun. Maybe floor. Oh, oh, I think we should tell them about our septic system. Oh, yes. yeah, that's what we'll do. We'll show yeah. you the septic system, which is in. Yes, <laughs> and that means a toilet can't be far behind. That's right. So that's what we'll do next week. We'll show you the septic system getting installed and maybe a few other odds and ends while we're at it. Make sure you go all the way to the end of the videos because that's where we put our bloopers. And of course, like and subscribe because uh, that helps other people who like these kind of videos find our videos. So until next time. A tutela. This one's a little bit thin, I think. So I'm going to add a bit more of the dry mix, and then I think we'll be about right. Shit. This still feels maybe just slightly, slightly too wet still. <laughs> it's creaking. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm going to keep this foot over here. That's probably a good plan. <laughs> just a wee bit more, and I think we're there. You can't lean on this. I'm going to add a wee a little bit more. You can lean on this, but you can't lean on this. Do I need to take this away? Make sure you cut this video. <laughs> Are you rolling? Yeah. Been rolling. <laughs> All right, that's it. We're going with that. This. 
might still be a little bit too wet, but we're gonna give it a go. No, it's too wet. I want it to be enough because my wrist is tired. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> 